Welcome to Trillions. I'm Joel Weber. And I'm Eric Balchunas. Eric, you know what we haven't done forever is a mailbag episode where people ask us questions about things like ETFs or whatever else, I guess, but probably ETFs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's good to get back to the basics. I felt when we started this podcast, a big part of our mission was education and just trying to um, educate people on what ETFs are, how to use them, uh, due diligence. And so it's interesting to ask people for and to solicit them for their questions now uh, and also just see where they're at. What are they curious about? I do this one show called The Money Show, which is a conference that you deal directly with retail investors. And I, it's a similar situation. It's nice to talk directly to the people because a lot of times we're working with advisors or the ETF industry itself who's like talking shop constantly. But mailbag is a good time to go back to like the basics, get the temperature of what people are thinking about and you know what what they don't know and are asking about. So I basically polled or solicited both LinkedIn and Twitter. Interesting the contrast on the types of questions on each site. LinkedIn a little more longer and professional sounding, uh, as you might imagine. Twitter a little more quick, some um, trolling and uh, even some weird questions in there. But all pretty good. I thought I thought there, a lot of them were pretty solid questions. So uh, looking forward to answering them best I can. Okay, well, here we go. We're going to dive into a bunch of questions, maybe an abbreviated version of it if it's a little long. Uh, and we'll do our best to, to answer all of them. This time on Trillions, mailbag. I'm going to start with a guy named Chuck Rose. He says, ETFs seem to have escaped the muddy waters of mutual fund share classes. But now you have SPY or SPLG or another example, QQQ or QQQM. Same issuers, same index, but different expenses, different spreads. What's going on? Yeah. So I, we, I would call this trend the mini me trend um, because every one of those is a mini me of the bigger uh, original one. So like SPY is the big dog. Why are they doing that? It's a it's a business decision on their part. So for example, let's say you're State Street and you have SPY and you charge nine basis points and the liquidity is so good that like you have a good audience. That said, Vanguard and iShares came out with similar products at three basis points. So you start to lose money to the longer term investors. And in order to deal with this situation of losing some assets to these new competitors, you come out with sort of like a mini me clone at a lower fee. This way, for the people who really need volume, like the professional traders and hedge funds who are going to use SPY regardless, you can still earn your nine basis points. But you then have a, a, a cheaper version to help keep flows in-house and, and coming in. So SPLG would be SPY's mini-me, and this charges three basis points. And it's been doing really well. Like It's got $41 billion now. And this has been happening for a long time. iShares kind of invented this trend when EEM was losing a lot of assets to Vanguard's VWO. So it came out with IMG, which was a mini me at about a fourth of the cost. And it did a good job. IMG is now, I think, around as big as VWO. And so this mini me move is, is a business decision from the issuer's point of view because they just, you know, it, they're trying to appease everybody without hurting their revenue too bad. Like, they could just cut SPY's fee to three basis points, but that would be a, instantly killing a lot of their revenue in one shot. Sometimes they do do that, but for these gigantic products that have so much liquidity, uh, you, you do have some pricing power there. So there, you can keep that cash cow alive and still serve the cheap, obsessed investors who don't care about volume. That's, that's why. All right, next question. Garrett O'Hara asks, what future innovations should we expect in the bond ETF space? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so fixed income is an area that is not quite as, doesn't get as much attention, but it's been evolving a lot. Like one thing that really took off that's recent is CLOs, collateralized loan obligations. Uh, Janus has one that's over $10 billion. And I thought that was proof that you can even discover new areas of the bond market. And I think that's what we're going to see is more slicing and dicing. Bond blocks has gone out and sliced and diced the credit uh, buckets. Like now you can get just triple C's. You know, iShares already has a double B. So they're going to go out and I, I think they're probably going to start slicing up sectors. And they might even like do interesting things like um, 
maybe in the muni space, they just give you like hospitals and schools. I, I would call that niche bond investing because, you know, you, when you buy the ag, you know, the ag is like huge. You get a bunch of bonds, but what people are doing a little more because the ag hasn't worked as well is trying to find pockets of fixed income that can like have more juice in it. Um, one filing we recently saw was for catastrophe bonds. I don't know if that'll go through the SEC, but that that would be really interesting. Um, but yeah, I think that's what 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 we're going to see is just more slicing and dicing, as well as more active. But I, they, people already do active, but there will be new managers coming in uh, for sure. Um, so I think that's probably what we can look forward to. Okay, Brian Williams asks: Do you expect to see ETFs? ever gain meaningful market share in the retirement plan world? Stuff like 401ks, 403bs, et cetera. Not really. Um, Why not? As we, as we discussed on a podcast back in the day, I can't remember which one, but ETFs, it's like Superman 2 when he has to give up his superpowers to be with Lois Lane. So he goes in this box and when he's in the box, that's the box sort of like takes away his ability to fly and dodge bullets and all that stuff. Um, and when he comes out of the box, he's a human again. That is just what ETFs and 401k plans are. In a 401k plan, you don't need to trade your fund. So the intraday liquidity goes away. In a 401k plan, you typically get the institutional share class of a mutual fund, which is the lower fee class because you're pooling all your money together with other colleagues. And so the cost goes away, that advantage. And then the tax efficiency of ETFs goes away because it's a tax deferred plan, right? So you lose basically the three main superpowers of ETFs in a 401k plan. So what people do in 401k plans is if they want low cost passive, they just buy like a any all BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, they all have index mutual funds that are dirt cheap. And the same thing you'd get from like VU or SPY, you just buy the mutual fund version. So people are satisfied with that again, because they don't need to trade it. The tax efficiency is not there. So I just am a big fan of the marketplace needing it and it doesn't need it here. So even though I think ETFs are great, I think you know they solve a lot of problems. The only caveat to that is if you have a small business and you can't afford the institutional class. Like this it's like, I don't know, a dozen employees and collectively you don't have enough minimum investment to get the I class pricing. That might make sense for an ETF. The other situation would be to get really like unique new stuff. Like there's no way you can get a Bitcoin mutual fund, right? But if you wanted a Bitcoin ETF, they're available now. So a lot of mutual funds will have a brokerage window where you can go out and like add to your mutual funds with some ETFs. And I think that's the, that's probably the perfect solution. So they'll have a tiny little role, but the, I don't think they'll ever like push out mutual funds. Uh, 401k uh, plans are, are sort of uh, going to be filled with mutual funds for a long time. There is one other thing is mutual funds are actually also offering CITs. I won't go into that, but it's a customized mutual fund. And those are actually getting traction inside plans too. Um, because people want to like negotiate the fee a little bit, but uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it there, but I don't really see much movement there. Randall Moore asks, what are your thoughts on return stacking that is now available in an ETF wrapper? Going forward, would th will this be a viable strategy to add into an alt bucket? in a retiree's portfolio? Um, yeah, so this is a new area, again, uh, that's, it's small, but it's growing quickly. Um, an example is RSST, the Return Stack US Stocks and Managed Futures ETF. To keep it simple, these have different arrangements, but basically, this is a strategy that gives you 100% exposure to US stocks and 100% exposure to a managed futures strategy. Because the futures, you don't actually have to um, buy the futures, you can borrow them. You're able to um, have 200% exposure, essentially. So I think in the institutional world, they call this portable alpha. And so in a way, you're able to sort of like um, have two things at once using leverage. Now, of course, if both of those things go down, you can get hit with a double whammy. But the idea here is just getting more bang for your buck. Um, and I, you know, I get it. I think, you know, some of them are like 90, 60. They have different varieties as every ETF category does, but you know, I'm okay with them. I think, like I said, um, this is something that an institution would do uh, normally and regularly. And people are trying to, 
again, try to democratize this for, for regular investors. Just obviously, you know, make sure that you understand the, the category and that anything that has leverage um, does have that. You ask yourself, okay, what's the environment where both things go down? And I think you have to be, make sure you're ready for that. Amrita Nandakumar asks, what is the ETF product innovation over the last few years that you are most impressed by? I love that question. Yeah, I got to go with the buffers, hmm. uh, This, which is also called targeted outcome. Bruce Bond used to run PowerShares, great guy, and um, he left PowerShares. Bruce Bond basically started Smart Beta, in my opinion, and Themes. He launched the first two, and those are massive categories. This guy's like a, he's a very entrepreneurial dude in the ETF space. And so he went, was looking for something to do and found this idea of targeted outcome. This is an ETF that uses flexible options, which are just customized options that the issuer negotiates. Um, and so they come up with these customized options that limit your downside. So there'll be something like, okay, uh, if for the next two years, we will give you up to 10% of the returns of the S&P. Um, but on the downside, you will only have to uh, eat 5%. The rest, the options will cover. And so you give up some of the upside. Usually it's you know the big upside um, for downside protection. And many older investors, this is why we call them boomer candy, many older investors are very happy to make that trade-off because they want to be in the market, they like the market, um, but they have, want protection. They want to sleep at night. It reminds me of the biotech industry making drugs for boomers to live longer and sleep better and all that. Like <laughs> This is the same thing. These are ETF issuers trying to make boomers feel better um, and manage their nerves. And honestly, when they first came out, I didn't see it that way. I thought these are just too complicated, but they sold them. And I had heard of advisors who were like, nah, I'd rather just stay diversified uh, with stocks and bonds. These aren't really worth it. Because remember, you can buy a money market fund now and get 5% a year locked in, no risk. So a lot of advisors are like, why don't I just do that? Then I can almost replicate the buffers with a regular portfolio. But the clients were like, no, I want these. Like they were like chomping at the bit to get that these products. So these were a grassroots hit. And I think the door on these opened big time in 2022 when the bark uh, the aggregate bond index, which is AGG, went down 13%. So stocks were down 19%, but your ag was down 13%. In other words, your 60 was down and your 40 was down. Normally, boomers in particular are so used to bonds going up when stocks go down. So when the when the ag went down with the stocks, they're like, wait, well, where's my protection now? And they got all this nest egg and they're like, I, the, I'm scared now. And so also the ag hasn't kept up with inflation at all. And so I think this opened the door to something more crafty, some kind of a solution. And these are, you know, essentially structured products. And so I think we're going to see a huge boom in these. You've now got BlackRock getting into this game. A lot of other big firms have, have jumped in. So so I think we'll continue to see more and more firms get get involved here. And you can make more money. The fees are higher. So we call these Vanguard free zones. So issuers love VFZs. So they're, you know, we're going to see a lot of action here. William Donahue asks, do you consider direct indexing to be competition for ETFs or more like the Buffalo Bills of investment products? <laughs> the Bills have lost like four Super Bowls, I think. And they're always like missing field goals at the worst time. They're like, a lot of hope and hype, and then they always disappoint. Yeah, um, direct indexing is something like that for sure. I my metaphor for direct indexing is the segue, Joel. Remember that that thing that you stand on that was supposed <laughs> to revolutionize yes. transportation. Why why walk and, at a convention when you can segue somewhere? Yeah, I mean, I, I I went back and Google by the way when I wrote my article on this, and they this was really heavily pitched like that. I believe Bill Gates might have been like one of the voices behind it, but everybody's like these are going to take over the world. And they basically are used by mall cops and city tours, and that's it. And I think direct indexing is the same thing because direct indexing is essentially saying, hey, instead of buying a cheap ETF, and you know, let's sell that, give me your money, and I'll buy, I'll, I'll recreate the ETFs by buying all the stocks. But if you want, we can pick out a stock or two to customize it to your needs, um, and then we can do some tax loss harvesting maybe to give you some uh, extra basis points of return there. It's a pretty decent idea. I think for very wealthy people, that tax benefit could be helpful. But arguably, it, char it they want to charge you like three or four times more than an ETF, even 10 times more. I think Schwab's and Fidelity's DI products are 40, 
But again, you can get the whole market for four or three basis points. You also find that once you buy all these stocks and people start moving stuff around, you're, you're kind of being active and you can underperform, right? And I think people generally like an income, like a statement with like six or seven tickers, not like thousands of stocks. And I think it can get confusing with DI. So DI to me tries to reverse three massive trends, simple, passive, and cheap. And I just think those trends are way too powerful. And so it'll be a niche uh, uh, vehicle at best. Uh, Eric, here's an interesting one. You win asks, do you have data on how much U.S. listed ETFs are owned by non-U.S. investors? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, it depends on the ETF, but generally speaking, for like the big dogs like SPY, VU, IVV, um, you're looking at around 15% would be foreign owned. And these would be like usually big institutions. What what we have in the U.S. that you really don't have anywhere else is like big boy liquidity. When you go to like, I don't know, a country like, uh, you know, I was in Mexico recently. I was in France recently. The volume on these ETFs is just pretty low. So, but a retail investor, no big deal. But if you're like a big institution, you want uh, an ETF that trades over a billion dollars a day. So you can come in and out without anybody noticing low impact cost. Our ETFs also tend to be cheaper than elsewhere in the world. So you get lower expense ratios. Um, that's an interesting question also this year, because this year in particular, and last year, we've actually seen more people using ETFs in their own countries to get into the US. Like in China, they're rushing to buy the NASDAQ 100. That said, it's through an ETF there that invests in the NASDAQ. So I do think that the 15% probably got somewhat of a lid on it. It's just big institutions who need liquidity. But the money pouring into the, into the US itself via local ETFs that invest in the US is going up quickly. Um, and in Europe, get this, there's more money Europeans have in U.S. stock ETFs than in their own local European huh. stock ETFs. Fascinating. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, there's just no nothing like – like the Magnificent Seven is like a U.S. phenomenon. And so um, sometimes in my first book, I said that the U.S., we ex export liquidity. Uh, that's how liquid some of these e names are. Plus, these ETFs, again, own – the best companies in the world, pretty much, or at least the best performing. And so it's a double magnet, really. Next one from Mungo Park, who asks, um, be, I'd be interested in your take on alt meme style ETFs. There's Indrush Kramer, Nancy Pelosi, Tracker Space, QQQ, Vice AI, and other concept ETFs that almost seem to be a parody similar to Doge or Bonk. Does this cheapen finance or are these alt DeFi style ETFs important? Um, okay, first of all, all of them ha are in the same kind of like wacky bucket, but then he throws the Qs in there. I would not call a QQQ anything <laughs> meme. That is a powerhouse locomotive stud uh, ETF that is serious business. But removing that one, yeah, Nancy Pelosi, Jim Cramer, um, the Vice ETFs. Look, this is kind of like fun and games. But I'm fine with it, and I'll tell you why. Over the last 30 years, portfolios have changed, and people have stopped. They used to date active managers. They'd go with the five-star manager, and when they went down, they'd go with the uh, the new five-star manager. And they were trading their cores a lot. When then Vanguard came along, made cheap index funds, and people got married, uh, to be honest. They, they stopped dating active managers and got married to the index fund. That said, married life is a little boring, Right. So, oh, you got to just wait 30 years for that index fund to compound. So they like to have a little fun. So there's a little portion of a portfolio for fun and games. Uh, we call it the hot sauce bucket. And th there's a lot of product coming out. You can charge a little more there. People have a higher fee budget to spend there. So I'm OK with it. And if playing around and having fun and games and, you know, uh, having a little, you know, sp scratching your speculative itch a little bit, if that keeps you from touching the core that has to comp that you know has to grow for thirty years, it, it it may even serve a behavioral purpose. So that's how I see it, and that's why I'm okay with the crazy stuff. Hernando Cortina asks: Are actively managed ETFs taking market share from passive or from mutual funds? Um, almost all mutual. I'm assuming they mean active mutual funds. Yes, I think it's new money coming in, and it's from active mutual funds. Passive is tough. The only situation with passive would be. Um, like in Vanguard's case, they're letting people move from the index mutual fund into the ETF. They're both doing the same thing, but 
and they can do that tax-free. But removing that unique situation aside, I think in general, again, if you're in a Fidelity Index mutual fund that charges two basis points or VOO, which is a ETF that charges two basis points, no big difference. Um, I think that it's harder though for an active manager to, to peel away money in passive. Because like I said, most people who are in passive, especially, you know, who, who, because they had to find it themselves. Passive doesn't pay any brokers to put people in it. So if you, if you were in a passive fund, you had to find that thing. And then you're like, damn, this is a good deal. It's like getting married. And so an active manager promising like, oh, I think I can beat the market. is just not going to be enough to get someone out of a happy marriage. So all the money is going away from active generally. That said, there are portions of the portfolio that people do have available for active. And one thing active has done that's worked has gotten cheap. So now active is getting like below 20, uh, even 10 basis points. And people are like, okay, well, that's almost as cheap as index fund. And I know you're active. So we'll, you know, you're only charging me like 10 basis points for the quote active. And they're getting a little more, it's a more, a little more seducing Joel. Low cost active is probably pulling from high cost active, to be honest, more than it is from passive. But, um, you know, who knows? We'll see what happens. But right now, again, if you can get the whole market for like three basis points and the market keeps going up like 10% to 20% every year, I mean, it's just impossible almost to like disrupt that at this point. All right, this one's from Twitter. Uh, Free State of Florida asks, explain the pre-market volume. Yeah, so if, if you look at uh, an ETF like SPY or, or any, any of them, well, I, not all of them trade pre-market. The big ones do. You'll see a price movement at like 8 in the morning, and you'll see volume at 8. It's not huge volume, but it's there. So it's a little tricky. If you There's a, services that allow you to trade these ETFs uh, outside of U.S. market hours. So... One is called Blue Ocean. Um, and so if you have a brokerage that's hooked up to Blue Ocean, you can trade SPY whenever you want. So, um, you, But you need this sort of third-party service to do it. And that's how pre-market volume happens. I think the big dogs out there, like big trading shops, they, they also obviously can do this. And so when there's something massive in the market that happens, like you know after a major event, I will go to SPY at like 7 30, 7.38 in the morning and just see where it's moving. Um, and so now you don't have to use the futures market anymore to find out what, how people are reacting. You can actually use the pre-market trading. Sean Tuffy asks, is an ETF a mutual fund? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Yes. Uh, in fact, when ETFs first were finally had to get on the market, they would file for exempt of relief because they weren't quite checking all the boxes of a mutual fund. But at their core, they are a mutual fund. Now, there are other things like gold. Um, and Bitcoin ETFs are trusts. They're not actually funds. But the vast majority of the ETF assets are in open-ended investment vehicles, which are mutual funds at their core. So as Reggie Brown put it, ETFs are essentially mutual funds with benefits. Okay, Ken Natal asks, what product strategy security needs to be ETFized? Yeah, so there's a couple things. It's hard to eat this like, private equity is something they're going to continue to try to ETF eyes. BlackRock says they're going to try to do it. I'm not sure how you do it. You kind of need the underlying to be somewhat liquid to make an ETF, but maybe that would be great. If, if ETFs could get you access to private equity, they would sell. Also, money market funds. There's no true like dollar nav money market fund ETF, although the Texas uh, issuer is going to try. We'll see if they can get that out. Um, physical diamonds. There was a couple ETFs filed to track physical diamonds, like physical gold. They never got through, but I could see somebody trying that again. And then like something like physical farmland or even physical real estate, I, that would be, again, I don't know how they'll do it, but that's something that I think would, would play well. I think some of these things are going to be tokenized. Any area that can't be ETFized, I think tokens using the blockchain down the road will be how they solve that. Um, but there is one product that I, that Ethan and I talk about a lot that actually Tom Keen back in the day used to bring up a lot as a joke. I'd go on his radio show and he'd be like, when's the triple leveraged cash ETF coming out? <laughs> and cause there was all these crazy launches, but now that cash yields t uh, 5%, we're surprised nobody's tried a two X or three X, uh, money market type, like a, a, a treasury bill fund where you could double or triple that that yield just like that. I think people would like that low duration 
and plus the yield with a little leverage. I can see something like that coming out too, but that's that's just an example of like a product that I that I could see coming out, but those other areas are bigger. Um, but it'd be interesting, you know, the ETF industry, as you know, Joel, is like the Silicon Valley of the asset management world, and they are gonna just keep, um, you know, pl- um, experimenting and trying what whatever they can, because there is, it's like a, you know, it's like a, the gold rush, there is, um, rewards to be had if you can get into something first. Um, and that will keep people trying almost anything and pushing the envelope. Okay, Eric, Terry Linux asks, did you know that VTI and chill is something teens say to each other? Did you know that? <laughs> okay, I did for, not know that. I didn't, I did I did. I, well, I, I didn't know that, but I, first of all, I'm just assuming VTI is, is the ETF ticker and not something else. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I, that's my assumption too. <laughs> Assuming it's the Vanguard Total Market Fund, that is interesting to me and a good sign. Um, I was recently at my friend's 50th birthday, and I was talking to my um, old friend from college who is a doctor now, and he was talking about listening to more financial radio. He's like, I know I could just voo and chill, but I'm interested (laughs) for more. And so I was like, wait, what did you just say? Voo and chill. So I do think the retail world has, uh, you know, it's almost like Netflix and chill, I guess, for Vanguard, Vanguard should run with that. They're, they're, you know, stop the commercials with like old people going to graduations and run with something more fun like this. If people are naturally coming out with these sort of viral phrases about your products, I think it's great. I mean, VU and chill, VTI and chill, that is a pretty good way to invest. I mean, that's smart in my opinion. So it's good they're saying that. I'm surprised. Last question comes from a fellow named Todd Rosenbluth, who shows up on the podcast from time to time, a little bit of a rival of yours, so Pierre. When is the last time you won an ETF stake dinner bet, Eric Balchunas? <laughs> and then he has a photo of you guys having uh, dinner together. So I guess you've, you've been on a little losing streak. I have. I, I they, These bets, though, I got to be honest, I, I feel like I win in spirit. I just lose by some slight technicality. But I think I'm three and two still. I think I won the first three. And then he's won the next two. Yeah. So I, don't, I guess it's been a couple of years, but I'm going to be back. Okay. You heard it there, Todd. Eric, these are some great questions. I just want to say thank you to everybody who asked them and everybody who listened to the podcast. We'll do another one of these episodes before too long and hope that everybody brings some more great questions for us. Thanks for joining us on Trillions, Eric. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Trillions. Until next time, you can find us on the Bloomberg Terminal, Bloomberg.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you'd like to listen. We'd love to hear from you. We're on Twitter. I'm at Joel Weber Show. He's at Eric Balchunas. This episode of Trillions was produced by Magnus Hendrickson. Bye.